Okay. Uh, so since we missed that, I'm going to go over this again. Um, so the recording is just starting. So the setup is we have a presynaptic terminal. This comes from a presynaptic neuron. Uh, the postsynaptic dendrite, and actually a spine is what receives, at least for excitatory synapses, is what we um, actually is used to communicate uh, information flows through the spine and then to the soma, which is a long way away. And the way um, information is transmitted is when a spike arrives, uh, neurotransmitter is released. That's these um, these little, little little yellow dots. So it's stored in these vesicles. There are a lot of vesicles, of course. Um, when they release, the effect of that, of releasing neurotransmitters is to open channels. Open channels. Um, and that's what allows, uh, that's what causes current to flow. And that's how synapses, communi neurons communi communicate with one another, okay? So the neurotransmitter binds to, to a receptors near the channels that opens them in, in current, flows, current flows, okay? And we're gonna be today, particularly at least the beginning, we're gonna be interested in NMDA channels. And that's because NMDA dependent plasticity, so NMDA dependent plasticity, plasticity um, is the most common kind for excitatory neurons. It's not universal, but it's pretty common, excitatory neurons. Okay. And we're gonna look at for a few minutes at the implications of this and what it predicts um, as far as, as changes in synaptic strength go. Um, so let's just remind you of what that was. Um, so we'll draw our postsynaptic um, spine, we'll draw it pretty big. And so if this is our NMDA channel, um, there is magnesium block. So Mg magnesium um, because remember the inside of the cell has relatively negative voltage. So voltage is negative in here versus out here that attracts magnesium ions, which block um, this channel from, from transmitting current. And if you remember correctly, um, so I in MDA, equals G, X, B minus E and A. That's around zero millivolts, but it gets divided by something that, that um, concentration of magnesium over 3.57 uh, EXP of minus V over 16.1 millivolts. Okay, and what that means is, is um, so X is, X is concentration dependent. Okay, so remember X, um, if there's a presynaptic, this is time of presynaptic spike. Um, so X is gonna come up and come down, okay. And time scales of, remember fairly long, maybe 150 milliseconds.
So it stays up for a long time. Uh, so that's X. But it, and if we but if we plot I in MDA, because of this voltage dependent, this blocking by magnesium channels, um, I in MDA looks like this. Let's say I at X equals one. Um, so this is zero millivolts, say minus 60, um, minus 20, minus 40, goes up and then it comes down, okay? So it's massively suppressed um, at low voltages from this term, because at low voltage, there's a magnesium block, okay? And so this gives us coincidence detection. Okay, you need the postsynaptic neuron to fire um, because when there's a spike, so eventually this goes, let's extend this, not really drawing the scale, but eventually it goes to the soma. And when a spike is generated, um, so a spike in the soma, Propagate backwards. Into the dendrite. Okay. So whenever, um, so normally the, the, the voltage um, So if this is voltage at spine, normally it's sitting here around rest. Whenever the soma spikes, the voltage goes up for a while and comes back. And so if um, a neurotransmitter is released when the voltage is high, you're gonna get some NMDA channel, um, current in the NMDA channel, okay? Okay, so, so the bottom line is, um, so if presynaptic neuron spikes, sorry, postsynaptic neuron spikes, spikes, and after that, So after that, um, the presynaptic neuron spikes, um, then there will be Uh, NMDA current. There'll be, be more accurate. There will be current through the NMDA channels. Okay. And so I mentioned this last time, I probably should have mentioned it earlier. Um, so what happens when current flows through the NMDA channels, um, a fairly complicated process ensues. So this is current. Um, actually, I'll do it on a new page. Um, so this is complicated and kind of important. Um, so we have our spine. Okay. So the NMDA channel. So in MDA current,
So that includes calcium. And calcium is this universal, universal signaling mo molecule in the, in, uh, in the brain. It does everything. How the brain is able to get by with one signaling, well, one main signaling molecule is unknown, but does it and includes calcium. And the calcium um, affects um, number of amplitude channels. Or let's, let's say changes. number of amplitude channels. Okay, it can either increase or decrease them. Okay, so this is, and so it's kind of important. It's not, it's not any calcium. You can't just add calcium to the synapse expecting something to happen. The calcium receptors actually live very close to NMDA channels. So the calcium channels that live there, complicated biophysical process, which I won't go into. Um, honestly, I don't know it all that well, causes eventually um, amplitude channels to be inserted. And, um, and sort of the change in amplitude channels as a function of calcium looks like this. So here's calcium through NMDA receptors. And this is a change in weight. in synaptic strength. And we can also think of that as um, sort of equal change in number of amplitude channels. Okay. And then actually, um, if a little bit of calcium it actually goes down and then it goes up. Okay, and this drop is really important. <clears throat> if this only caused an increase in weight, the synaptic strength gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and then your head would explode. Okay, so let's go over this picture. It's kind of insanely complicated. So it starts here <clears throat> um, when a spike arrives, um, causes vesicle release, opens neuro, releases um, neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter binds to many channels, including NMDA channels. Um, and when those NMDA channels, but whether or not those NMDA channels open depends on the voltage in the spine. If the voltage in the spine is too low, nothing happens. Okay. Um, if the voltage in the spine is sort of around, you know, minus, if it's too high, nothing happens either because it goes past the reversible channel. Potential. But this sweet spot around minus 20, um, in which there is an MDA influx. Okay. And that requires um, a spike at the soma to happen. Um, and when that happens, um, what happens is if there's an MDA current, uh, it includes calcium, the calcium binds to receptors and initiates a complicated process that eventually can either insert amplitude channels or delete them, okay? And the amount of, of amplitude channels depends on how much, um, how much calcium is in there, okay? There's a little bit actually reduces synaptic strength. It's a lot, it increases synaptic strength. Okay, that's the picture. Um, it's pretty well characterized experimentally, um, but, Let's go to the textbook picture. It doesn't, as we'll see, quite hold up. So let's see what that, this predicts about um, experiments. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how people do experiments in this field. Um, so there are several ways to do plasticity experiments, and this is how most plasticity is determined. Um, so what one typically does is patch a cell. Now these cells are. Rare, this is rarely done in, in, in a live 
awake animal in, in vivo or live um, anesthetized animal in vivo. It's typically done, so experiments, so experiments are typically done in slice. So a slice basically means you, you kill an animal and slice its brain up into small pieces, put it in some fluid you think looks like the fluid in the brain and do experiments on it. Um, typically done in slice, sometimes in tissue culture. And in fact, I'll talk about some very famous experiments in tissue culture. And tissue culture is basically you just take some neurons from a brain and regrow them. And tissue culture is nice because the neurons are really easy to get to. And the way the experiments are done is you find two neurons, you look in a microscope, and you stick a pipette into two neurons that are connected. Um, oops. Actually, let's go with my old convention. Um, this is synapse. So this is pre. And this is post synaptic. Okay. So those are the neurons, and you stick a pipette in. The pipette. I believe somebody got a Nobel Prize for inventing that pipette. This goes to show. Um, you stick a pipette in both neurons, and then you can manipulate them. So typically what you do is you'll stimulate this neuron um, while doing various things here. So for instance, you can make this neuron spike and then stimulate this neuron. And the prediction from NMDA channels is, from the NMDA channel um, picture is, if you make this one spike first and then um, have this presynaptic neuron, uh, and then presynaptic spike here, you can change synaptic strength, okay? And the way synaptic strength is measured is, is um, you don't do anything to the neuron and just stimulate. So, um, and just measure the height. So in an experiment, you'll, um, so you can do two things. So you can um, sort of modify this, but you can also um, use the post synaptic uh, by pet to measure synaptic strength. So for instance, you can do an experiment where, um, so stimulate, so presynaptic spike, so this is versus time, happens here. And then you can look at the um, postsynaptic potential. Potential. Also, often known as PSP. Oops, do it very carefully. PSP. Okay, and you can measure the height of this. So the height of this gives you gives you um, a measure of synaptic strength. Um, so height. So height, we can take that to be synaptic strength. And of course, these measurements are very noisy. So what, what typically is done is you do lots and lots of these. Um, let's show a couple. You do another trial, another trial, you get, you get, you know, it's not always the same. Maybe it'll be a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit bigger. Okay. So you can take the average height as, as a synaptic strength, and then you run some LTP protocol. And the LTP protocol might be simulate the presynaptic neuron, or simulate the postsynaptic neuron, and then simulate the presynaptic neuron, um, and then you remeasure the height. Okay. And if all goes well, you get you know something a lot different where. Um, this can be much bigger. 
So this is a case where um, this is called potentiation. Okay. And this is a huge, insanely complicated field. Um, there's long, there's something called um, long LTP and short LTP. Sometimes you can get these changes. The question is how long do these changes last? Um, and sometimes they'll last an hour. You really want to check days later, which is very hard to do. Um, so two hours is considered a change. Um, it depends on all sorts of, um, it depends on, on what the cell sees. You can block it. Um, you can have short, you can have LTP that lasts say half an hour, but goes away if you block certain um, neuromodulators. But we're going to kind of ignore all that. We're just going to say, okay, um, you know, what is some presynaptic and postsynaptic pairing? We can just ask the question if it makes the postsynaptic neuron fire, and then the presynaptic fire, neuron fires 20 milliseconds later, and we do that over and over and over again, does synaptic strength go up or down? Okay. And given what we, our prediction, Given our, our NMDA story, we can now ask, what should we affect? What should we expect? Um, and it's, this is kind of a good useful exercise. It's sort of what we do in science. We make up a story and then we may ask what prediction does it make? And if the predictions are consistent with the story, we can say, okay, we know what's going on. So the story is so basically if this is time axis. So this is, um, this is T post equals time of postsynaptic spike. Okay. So if a presynaptic spike um, comes later, so we can actually now, so what do we expect? Postsynaptic spike arrives um, and let's plot versus time, um, the voltage. So the voltage um, memory potential should go up and then down. So this is voltage at spine, at spine, due to back propagating action potential. And the time scale of this is about, this is about, so we'll say, you know, uh, 10, Depending on how close the spine is, it is 10 to 50 milliseconds. Okay, so it can be kind of slow. 50 is pretty long, but, but 10 is not unusual, okay? So what do we expect now? If we now actually look at the time of the presynaptic pre time of the presynaptic spike, okay? So now we're gonna put in time of presynaptic spike. So if the presynaptic spike um, is, so first of all, So this is now T pre. So if a presynaptic spike happens here, we expect nothing to happen. Okay, so what we're gonna do is you, on the bottom, we're gonna, we're gonna plot to um, so effective T pre. Let's say on calcium influx. Okay. So it's really sort of the effect on, T, on, on, uh, on the um, NMDA current. So if the presynaptic spike happens before the postsynaptic spike, the voltage is gonna be really low, right? So the voltage just sort of sits down here. Um, the voltage is, is low before the postsynaptic neuron spikes. So if, if the presynaptic spike happens there, um, nothing happens right? It's flat. If the presynaptic spike happens here at the peak, okay, 
In that case, the calcium influx is large. That happens right when the voltage is high, you get a lot of calcium influx. Um, so it can even happen. And so um, you might think that if the presynaptic spike happened here, T pre happens here, um, nothing ha much happens here. But remember, NMDA channels are, um, are so the, the um, neurotransmitter stays in the synaptic cleft, open the NMDA channels for a long time. So you actually get some spillover, even if it happens here. So if it happens before the presynaptic spike, you get some, some um, incoming calcium, and it kind of goes like this, okay? There's a sweet spot where um, you get the most influx of calcium, um, but if you're too early, uh, there's no, the, the presynaptic, the current's faded away by the time the voltage goes up. If you're too late, the voltage will already drop. Okay, so that's the calcium influx. But remember, so what's that? So now we can ask about the effect on the on the um, NMDA on the AMPA channels. And remember, a small amount of calcium actually causes a decrease. A large amount causes an increase. Okay, so the picture we can so um, if this is our cutoff, we should get expect so. LTP, which is long-term potentiation. Okay, above the red line and below the red line, which is basically insertion of AMPA channels. And then down here we have LTD, um, long-term depression. Okay, and that's deletion of AMPA channels. Okay, so this gives us a spike timing dependent plasticity term, um, picture. And for that, typically people plot on this axis, um, time of the postsynaptic spike minus the time of the presynaptic spike, okay? So if the presynaptic spike comes, so this is zero. If the presynaptic spike comes before the postsynaptic spike, this is positive, right? So this is zero, this is 10 milliseconds, this is positive, and we sit out here. If the postsynaptic spike comes bef um, after the presynaptic spike, uh, we sit over here in the negative region, okay? And we're gonna plot on this axis um, the change in the weight per spike or per, per pairing. Delta W, you know, per pre post pairing. So every time you pair a presynaptic spike with a postsynaptic spike, what do you get? And what this picture suggests is something, something like this. So if the pairing comes too early, we're in this regime, okay? So here, I should have lined up. Let me let me line up here. So this is our zero. So if we're over here, it's actually negative. Um, so if we're if we're way over here, it's zero. Some regime where it's negative, then it goes positive and negative again. So what we expect is. Um, Oh, it's switched. This is where it gets complicated, okay? So the way I drew the picture um, on this side, so everything gets flipped, which is sort of an unfortunate way of the way they, they plot the plots. So over here, so T post 
minus T pre is positive. Okay. And on this side, T post minus T pre. Sorry. T post minus T pre is negative. Okay. So things flip. So what this means is this is where T post minus T pre is negative on this side. So all this stuff indicates that there's actually a positive change. Um, synaptic strength goes up and then it comes down and then goes over here and here it just fades away. Okay. So this side corresponds to this and this side corresponds to this. Okay. So we, this is a spike time dependent uh, learning curve and it's, I'll do it on the next page. Um, so this is T post minus T pre. Um, this is zero. This is delta W. And our prediction, our prediction is something like this. This, with this generic shape. We don't know what exactly what it looks like, but we expect it to look something like this. Um, and that's because if the post comes well after the pre, there's no, there's, um, NMDA channels can't come open and otherwise it lives over here. And depending on delays, it's gonna be shifted sort of back and forth. Um, but this is a generic thing that we expect from this analysis. Um, so what did we actually see? So there was an incredibly famous experiment in um, 1998. Let me absolutely double check. Yeah, 1998. So this was tested. in tissue culture using exactly the kind of experiments I described earlier um, by B and Poo. So I'm gonna butcher this name. You can pronounce it better than I can. So, well, Q-I-N-G, I-A-N-G. Bojang B um, and Mooming Poo. At the time they were in San Diego. Now they're both back in China. So in 1998. And they didn't find what we predicted. Instead, this is a T post minus T pre. This is zero. They found this incredibly sharp curve that looked like this, and it sort of all seems to change almost instantaneously, and went like this. Okay, so this is a classic STDP curve. And STDP stands for spike. Time dependent plasticity. Okay. And it's nice because it looks really causal. In this regime, presynaptic spike, known pre before post. The presynaptic spike happens before the postsynaptic spike. It looks like it's causing the neuron to fire. In this region, um, pre after post. So it's actually not really in, involved in making a neuron fire. 
postsynaptic neuron fires and then the presynaptic neuron fires, which for NMDA is good, but it turns out experimentally, um, that's not what happens. And this has since been verified. So since been verified. In slice recordings. So actually the meeting where they, they, where they presented this and people are super excited. Um, and the reason it's super excited is because this, this looks causal. Um, it's also kind of weird, the, short, the cutoff, I mean, you can look, I put the paper online, you can look at it, I think it's figure seven. This is a really sharp cutoff. The time scale is around, this is minus 40 milliseconds. to plus 40 milliseconds. Okay, so spikes had to occur within about 40 milliseconds of each other. They had to be causal to get, cause an increase. If they're non-causal, to cause a decrease. And then there's, there's this, this, these tails, okay? Um, this is very hard to explain. Um, from NMGA channel Okay, this is not really what the VH channels predicted. There are some theoretical models out there that give something like this, but then they're, they're not very satisfying. So um, this is really kind of not exactly known mechanistically really how this happens and the relative timing and NMDA channels. Um, I think will work out eventually, but it's kind of unknown at this point. Um, so so those, so this is it's might might be worth so it's going over this story again. So well, we talked about the NMDA channel, which was complicated, right? These channels open, flux of current, you need a positive voltage here for things to happen. Um, but if, and then if you play out that story, it predicts an STDP, STDP curve that looks like this, right? And the reason that you need potentiation here is in this regime, the postsynaptic spike happens first and then the presynaptic spike and that's what you need to raise the voltage. So how this curve gets shifted over and why you don't see these negative lobes here, um, actually, sorry, this goes down as well. And why you don't see these negative lobes on either side is not, okay? Because the real picture looks a lot more like this. So this generated a huge amount of excitement among theorists. Um, there were probably hundreds of thousands of, of person years spent on trying to figure out the implications of this. Um, it looks really, um, it just looks, it just, it looks so intuitive for these right now. Um, it looks really intuitive that the presynaptic neuron causes the postsynaptic neuron to fire. Well, of course, that's probably a good idea and the weight should strength and that should increase this, the, the weight. But I should point out that there's no air signal here, okay? So it's not clear this is a good idea. And what I wanna do now is look at the implications of this rule. So, so what are, implications of this row. Um, and also implications of of rules uh, with no error signal. Um, in general. Okay. If you might think with no error signal, they, these, these would, be, would be completely useless. It turns out that's not exactly true. They can do things. Um, but I think eventually we're going to need to figure out where the error signal comes from. So I've been talking for about 40 minutes now. I'm going to write down um, 
a set of equations and take a five minute break and, and you can sort of try to digest them. And what we're gonna do is um, write down a set of equations to describe what happens um, to the synaptic strength under this, this, under this particular rule. Okay. So let me um, start by, with a picture. So this is time. On the top, I'm going to draw pre, synapt, pre, so T pre. So these are times, let's say a bunch of presynaptic spikes, it happens sort of at random times. On the bottom, I'm going to put T post, the times of postsynaptic spikes. Okay. And what we're going to assume is every time there's a spike, um, that causes a change in, in synaptic strength, instantaneous change. And so let's say there is a postsynaptic spike. So we'll look at one of these postsynaptic spikes, this one here. Oops. So we we'll look at this postsynaptic spike and ask what happens. So what the synapse can do is look, oh, sorry, is look back at all the presynaptic spikes that preceded it, right? And according to this picture, right, if, um, if T post is bigger than T pre, right, um, you get some poten you get potentiation. So whenever there's a postsynaptic spike, um, what the synapse can do is look backwards in time with some decaying um, I think I'd be better at this. Okay. So look backwards in time. So I'm going to call, I'm going to actually give these names. So I'm going to call this K plus. Mm. And call this lobe K plus. I'm going to call this K minus. Okay. And it just refers to this lobe. I'm going to define them. Um, define them. So K plus equals. Uh, theta So k plus of t equals k zero plus just some number um, e to the minus t over tau plus times theta of t. Um, theta of t means one if t is positive and zero if t is negative. So k minus of t and that so this is the shape. So basically, I just assumed for simplicity that um, this is exponential, okay, exponential decay, but it doesn't really matter. You can have it any shape you want. That's not at all particularly relevant for this. Um, and then, so K minus of T equals K minus zero, just some number, E to the T over tau plus, sorry. Uh, minus theta minus t. So this looks into the past. Okay. Actually, let's yeah, it looks into the past, and theta of t is heavy size step function equals one if t is greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, and zero if t is less than zero. Okay. So these are just exponential kernels. That's the shape of these things. Um, the shape isn't so important. We just we just basically gave some names, okay? So we take now, so this is K plus. Um, so this curve is K plus. And what it tells us is that, um, I'm gonna call this number, actually I'll give these, I'll give these names. That'll be easier. 
So this is this is a time, right? So this is T post. And I'll call this T pre number one and T pre number two. Okay. Um, so the amount this changes is delta W. So delta W due to the spike at T equals T post is equal to um, K plus value at, at, at T post minus T pre number one plus K post, well, proportional to, there's gonna be some learning rate plus K plus K plus T post minus T pre two. And then in principle, you wanna look at all postsynaptic neurons, presynaptic neurons, but eventually it's gonna K away. And these are the most important ones, okay? So this is kind of important. Whenever a postsynaptic neuron spikes, you just look backwards in time and that causes potentiation. And the farther back you are, the less potentiation because this is decaying in time into the past. We can also do the same thing for um, a presynaptic spike, okay? Let's take this presynaptic spike and now we look backwards um, We look backwards according to K minus, okay? If a presynaptic neuron occurs before a postsynaptic neuron, we're in here in this region, okay? And now there's a decrease, a, a, um, a drop in, in, in um, synaptic strength. And for this one, so this is our, um, and again, we're gonna give these names, um, so T post one and T post two, okay. And so this is this is for this one, for this one, delta W at T equals, give this a name, uh, T pre. Actually, let's give these names stars. T equals T pre star is partial to K minus the minus sign because things drop. And now it's T post one minus T um, pre star minus K minus of T post two minus T pre star minus dot, dot, dot. Okay, this is a star, this is a star. Okay. Um, and this number in here is negative, right? Post is before pre. Um, so this is a negative number and this is a negative number. And that's good because negative numbers um, are what activate this. Okay. So it's kind of a complicated picture if you draw it, but in principle, but in practice, it's really simple, right? Every time we see um, the postsynaptic spike, we just look at the past of the presynaptic spikes, and the ones that occurred recently cause a potentiation. If we see a presynaptic spike, we look back at the postsynaptic spikes, and the ones that occurred, occurred recently cause a depression. Okay, so we're going to turn that into um, sort of a more convenient set of equations um, uh, in a little while. But let's take a five-minute break. And hopefully you can stare at that and it'll make some sense. I'll save these to photos before I forget. Um, when I come back, I'll start a new, well, I won't quite start a new whiteboard. Um, okay, we need a quick five minute break. I'll be here if you have any questions.
Okay, I'm back. Um, I'm going to actually turn these equations into something more useful. Um, and then I'm going to actually get rid of these slides and start over because I'm going to run out. Slide them on. Okay. So if you look at this, um, so what this is, both of these are convolutions. Okay, these are convolutions. This and this, okay? And we can write the right-hand side as, um, so we'll take this one. and write it as k plus of, actually the way I write it is, is k plus star um, s pre evaluated at time t post star. And what this is equal to, what this means is integral from minus infinity to t um, let's say dt prime k plus evaluated at t star post minus t prime actually to t well I'm gonna actually, instead of tweeting, um, uh, this is T post star. Um, and S pre of T prime, where S pre is just a sum of delta functions. It's a sum on I of delta of um, T pre I minus t prime, okay? So it's a delta function um, where, wherever there's a spike, okay? And basically, I'm not sure, I'm gonna assume, if anybody wants me to define a delta function, I will. Um, but basically this means, kind of running out of room, um, this is exactly the same as that. What it does is whenever there's a, a, um, a presynaptic spike, you just put it in there and add another term on, okay? So it just generates all these terms at the time of a presynaptic spike, except before I had a subscript and now a superscript, okay? So S pre is, this is, S pre is a spike train. So it's kind of a convenient characterization of the spike train. It's just a bunch of delta functions. And if there's a delta function, that adds on to this, this kernel, okay? And what that means is we can write a sort of very um, convenient, we can write what happens to the weights in a very convenient form. We can write tau dw dt um, equals, the sum on I of delta of T minus T post, yeah, I'll put the post on top, post an ethic spike I, and then K star, K plus star S pre of T. Okay, and that, it's just shorthand for, um, for this term, okay? This is the time of postsynaptic spike, you get a kick. Okay, I'm gonna actually tell you a little bit about delta functions in a sec. Um, and then minus, minus the sum on I of delta of T minus T I post, times K minus star S post 
sorry. These are now presynaptic spikes. Um, Ki star s post t. So s post t looks backwards in time. Um, if you went back to here, s pre looks forward in time. Um, so we're going to write. Well, also looks backwards. Well, it looks backwards in time, but with a with a, a sign flip. Okay. So this term here is. Um, so this term here is the integral from minus infinity to t dt prime k minus of t minus t prime. Um, sorry. Backwards. K minus of t prime minus t. times the sum on j of delta of t prime minus t post j. So times of all the, all the spikes. So this integral is exactly equal to, um, basically what it is, is this, when you integrate over a delta function, you just take these t primes and set it equal to t j post, um, and this integral is exactly equal to sum on j of k minus of t j post minus t, okay? And the posts are coming before the t, um, so this is negative, um, the argument is negative and negative argument is what gives a positive k minus um, because of this, okay? And we also see the direction switch, right? The pre sits here and the post sits here, okay? So I'm gonna do one more thing and, and, and write stuff down. Um, so I should probably review delta functions just in case. So delta of t as a function of t, so this is zero, it's basically super, it's infinitely, infinitely high and infinitely narrow. So infinitely high, high, and infinitely narrow. Narrow, and area equals one. So the integral from you know, minus a to plus b of delta of t um, equals one if b is greater than zero and a is greater than zero, okay? So that you probably know what um, you may not know is how, how to deal with delta functions in, in differential equations. Um, I'm gonna mention that and then we'll, um, because it's kind of important. So we have tau dw dt, let's say equals delta t times some other function of t. Okay. So delta t is zero when t is not equal to zero. So, and we actually, we can write um, w of t equals one over tau, the integral say from minus infinity to t dt prime, Delta of t prime, f of t prime. Okay. And so remember, if you go back to here, um, we needed b greater than zero and a greater than zero because we have to integrate over a delta function. Um, if, if b is negative, for instance, so this is our delta function. Let's do a long skinny thing. So we had a here or minus a and we had b here. Um, we have to integrate across the delta function. If we took b and moved it over here, we'd get zero. If we took a and moved it to this side, we get zero. Um, and the same thing is happening here. If t is less than zero, we get zero. So if t is greater than zero, um, basically we get f of t is, this is only non-zero when t is zero. 
So if t is greater than zero, we get um, one over tau uh, f of zero, of zero. And we can put theta of t, which means one, remember if t is greater than or equal to zero, and zero of t. So it's a really convenient way of, of writing things. Um, and so if we, had, if we have tau dw dt equals delta of t minus ti f of t, it's the same thing. Uh, we have to integrate across ti to pick anything up. And when we do that, um, that implies the w of t equals f at ti. It's the only place the delta function is non-zero over tau times theta t has got, got to be greater than ti, okay? So in some sense, you integrate a delta function, you get a theta function. And that's why these differential equations, um, which give you a jump every time there's a spike, are equivalent to um, these, these discrete equations, where basically whenever there's a postsynaptic spike, we just add these terms together. Whenever there's a presynaptic type, we just subtract these terms. Okay. So let me save all this to videos. I'm gonna um, now stop. My video went away. I'll be really happy when Zoom allows more than 12 whiteboards. I don't really know why they only allow two. Um, anyhow, okay. So I'm gonna rewrite the equations. We're gonna analyze them. Um, we have tau, dwdt. equals the sum on i delta of t minus t post i k star s post pre value at a time t minus the sum on i delta of t minus t i pre K minus star S post of T. Okay. Now S pre, um, so if you look at S pre, for instance, you can think of S pre as something like this. Um, it's basically a delta function whenever there's a spike. So we're going to approximate S pre. Um, by just a firing rate, okay, which may change in time. So approximate S pre by firing rate. And that's, I mean, that's obviously delta functions are much different than a constant rate, but remember we're convolving it with this term. So this is sort of, and that gives average behavior. In fact, if we were to average this quantity over, if we sort of average this over lots of realizations of the spike train, we would get exactly the, 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 um, the firing rate, okay? So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna let S pre, we're gonna replace this by nu pre of T. I'm gonna divide this by nu post of T. Okay. Um, and we're gonna do the same, we're gonna make a really crude approximation and do the same thing for the, for the firing rate here. We're gonna replace this thing by nu post. It's replaced by the fine rate of t and replace this by new pre of t. Okay. And we get the sort of, and this is actually surprisingly good approximation. And you can think of it as, as sort of an average over lots of realizations of the spike train. DWT equals new post value at time t and then times k plus convolved 
with nu pre. So this allows for uh, time varying firing rate on both sides minus um, nu pre of t k minus star nu post of t. Okay. And this quantity here is equal to integral from minus infinity to t um, k plus of t dt prime t minus t prime nu pre of t prime. Okay. And this is the integral to minus infinity to t dt prime uh, k minus of t prime minus t nu post of t prime. Okay, this is our model. We've taken these spike trains, we just average them. Um, it's surprisingly a good approximation. It, 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 it works as long as the firing rates don't change super rapidly. Okay. Um, and so let's actually now consider a really simple case. So case one, um, new post and new pre are constant. So in that case, we get the WDT, the change in the firing rate. So if you look back at this, um, there is, so this is just a constant, it comes out, oops. This is a constant, it comes out of the integral. Both of these come out of the in integral. We have a new post times new pre, new pre times new post. We just have these two integrals. Um, and so we get, what we get is equals new post, now a constant, times new pre, also constant times the integral, um, actually zero to infinity, dt prime k plus of t prime minus integral from zero to infinity, dt prime k minus of minus t prime, okay? And this is actually equal to, um, remember our STDP curve looks like this, So this quantity here is total area under the STDB curve. Okay. And that kind of makes sense, right? If you have more potentiation than depression, the weight's going to go up. If you have more depression than potentiation, the weight's going to come down. Okay. Um, so to avoid weight drift, so this, this is actually sort of a problem. So to avoid weight drift, uh, you want the area to be, area should be zero. Which is a serious fine tuning problem. Okay, if you're a little bit off, too big or too small, then, then the weights just diverge, okay? Um, so that's the first, the first um, observation is, and in fact, experimentally, these are pretty close to adding up to zero, but it's not really a feature that we think is a good one for synapse. They shouldn't have to do massive fine tuning. Um, it's just hard to do that. Um, you don't want your weights just drifting away. So now we're gonna consider a more realistic case where so what really happens um, with synapses is um, when you have a presynaptic spike, right? So this is, um, you know, you have two neurons connected to each other. Um, 
So it has some dendrites. Okay. When this neuron spikes, it actually makes this neuron more likely to spike. Okay. So what we expect is that new post equals, let's say new post zero plus, actually this, we don't, it really don't, we don't expect it to be a constant. So this part is constant. plus epsilon times the weight times nu pre. Okay. Um, and the reason that, well, this is sort of downside of, of, um, of, this, of the uh, picture we had. That's actually, this isn't really a function of time. So this is in the firing rate world, um, the higher that, all this says is the higher the presynaptic neurons firing, the higher the postsynaptic, the higher the firing rate of the postsynaptic neurons. Okay, so this is an, so what really happens, of course, if there's a spike, there's a, a brief increase in the firing rate of this neuron, but on average we can just average it. Okay, and now if you go back to um, if you go back to our expression, so this one here. Um, involving the pre and post is now a little bit different, okay? Um, so remember that, it's, it's new, oops. This is new post. Um, so there are various approximations we can make, but this term here is one that changes, right? Because the presynaptic neuron causes the postsynaptic neuron to come up, Postsynaptic neuron doesn't affect the presynaptic neuron, so this changes the set, stays the same. So what we get when we do that is that tau dwdt equals new post constant plus epsilon w new pre. I'm going to give this a name. Um, I'm gonna give this quantity a name because it's gonna show up again. So this is, call it A plus. And I'll call this A minus. So A, A plus and minus, um, these are areas. So use A for area. Area under the curve. Okay. Um, so we have an A plus here. Minus, oops, and then um, times new pre, remember? Minus new pre, a minus new post. So we get new post, new pre, a plus minus a minus, what we saw earlier, plus epsilon times a weight times a plus times new pre squared, okay? Um, we'll give this a name. This is um, called this W naught. It's got units of weight. And we'll call this quantity here lambda. So we have tau dwdt equals lambda w plus w naught, okay? Um, and if pre and presynaptic neuron, so uh, lambda is greater than zero for a pre excitatory presynaptic neuron, you can think of inhibitory ones, it just change the sign. Okay, so we used to have a finite, um, a fine tuning problem. Now it's worse. Now we have an instability. Okay, 
So asymptotically, W eventually goes as, um, as e to the tau over lambda, which of course goes to infinity. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? And this is actually a problem with all rules of this type without, um, you have to do something because, you, I mean, we barely had to do all this analysis, right? If um, the synaptic, if the change in synaptic strength is involves some pre-post pairing, um, as the weight gets stronger, the pairing gets stronger and the weight gets stronger. You have this, this sort of, this loop that goes between um, the weight getting stronger, causing the coincidence, these two to be more likely to be a coincidence. It's really the coincidence that's causing the change in weights. Um, and that leads to this exponential growth in synaptic strength. Okay, so that's a bit of a problem. Um, and so it turns out, if you look in the original B and Poo paper, um, there was enough information in there to fix it. Um, and it turns out that if you look at, at um, the change in weights, it's different. So, so we have this, this picture the excitatory lobes where um, if you have excitation, um, things go, you know, things go up. If you have inhibition, things go down. It turns out that increase and decrease in weight changes are treated differently. Um, the actual story is that for inhibitory neurons, um, so if an inhibitory lobe, so change in weight, In, in weight is scaled by weight. Okay. And what that means is that, you know, the, the, the bigger the, um, the inhibitory weight, the, the more it's, it's, the more it decreases. Okay, we can write, it might be easier actually if you just write down an equation. Um, so we have tau dw dt equals new post k star nu pre. We all equation was nu pre k star nu post. But now we've added w, okay? So experimentally, this is some factor gamma here. So experimentally. Okay, it's experimental observation, and that has a huge effect, right? So we're going to replace, remember, we replace new post by new post plus epsilon w new pre. And when we plug all this in, we get new post new pre um, a plus minus a minus. Um, and then we have plus epsilon w um, nu pre squared a plus. We now have minus gamma w nu pre nu post um, times a minus. Okay. So this thing we can again call w naught this is omega naught to some number. And then we have minus omega. So we have gamma um, nu pre nu post a minus a minus epsilon nu pre squared a plus. So by just having this proportional factor in, so this is, um, so this is usually small. So unless nu pre gets huge, this number is positive. And now our equation is um, tau d w d t equals w naught minus, call it mu w. Um, so this is now stable. So w um, 
on average is approximately is basically W amount over mu. Okay. Um, and I included the, the there's, a, there's a paper where um, this is uh, all worked out um, on the webpage. So this is nice, right? We started off with this rule that was um, sort of badly unstable and it's fixed in the brain by a very simple mechanism. And the mechanism, mechanism is that um, as the synaptic strength gets bigger, I mean, it does something that's, that's pretty reasonable. As synaptic strength gets bigger and bigger, this lobe grows as well. The amount of depression increases and it keeps the uh, synapses from running rate to very high values. Um, and it's kind of nice because if you add a little bit of noise, um, then you actually get some distribution of weights. It looks a little bit like what you see in the brain. Okay, we have five more minutes. Um, so I put actually, so there's um, other ways of stabilizing uh, synapses. Um, so on the webpage, but the famous BCM uh, rule, which is kind of cool, but um, not, enough, not enough time to talk about it. Um, there's actually a famous BCS theory in, in physics that won the, um, it's a model for super, super conductivity that won the Nobel Prize. Um, and the, B, the C in the BCS was the same as C in the BCM. He was hoping for a second Nobel Prize, but didn't get it. So I'm gonna very quickly talk about um, network level. So what happens at a network level? So can these rules, can, can rules with no error, error feedback, so error signal be useful? And the answer is yes. Um, and we're gonna, a really simple model, forget spikes. We're gonna have a model Y equals W dot X. So this is input and this is output. Um, it could be output of a single neuron, it could be output of lots of neurons, it doesn't matter. We'll keep it very abstract. And we have training examples um, x mu, y mu. So mu equals one to lots of training examples. Okay. In fact, we're going to let t go to infinity. And our learning rule. So is pre-post. Just like um, our other rule was pre-post, we had pre-synaptic spikes and post-synaptic spikes, but our learning rule is gonna be delta W um, equals eta XY or YX. So this is a presynaptic term, actually postsynaptic term, and a presynaptic term. Okay. And if we average over lots of training examples, we can write dwdt equals we can absorb the eta into our time and we'll put a tally here. Um, is the average value of y x. Um, equals average value of w dot x x equals um, w dot the average of x x. And this is just the covariance matrix. Okay, which we're gonna call this, um, I'm gonna call this C. Okay, so we have tau dw dt equals C dot W. And we can actually solve this quite easily. Let's go to the next page. We're gonna let W 
equals the sum on k of a k v k. The v k is the eigenvectors of c. So um, c dot v k equals lambda k v k. C is symmetric, so we have v k. We can choose v k dot v l equals delta k l. One k equals l. Zero k is not equal to l. Okay. Um, and so our equation is tau dw dt equals c dot w. Okay. We take w and stick it in there. We have tau ddt of the sum on k of a k b k equals c dot the sum on k of a k b k. But remember, c dot a k is this lambda k a k, and ddt can be taken inside. So this becomes the sum on k sum on k of d a k d t times v k equals the sum on k of lambda k a k v k. And then we just dot this with v l on both sides and v k dot v l um, is delta k l. So this dot product picks out only one of the k's, okay? And we end up getting tau d a l d t equals lambda l a l, okay? So what this says is the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue gets bigger and bigger and bigger, gets biggest fastest. And you eventually dominated. Um, so eventually dominated by um, eigenvector. Largest eigenvalue. And that's a function of the data. Okay. So the data really tells you the eigenvalue structure. So, so this so this network, these weights are learning something about the, the actual, the weights are actually learning something about the input data. So they may not be learning something very sophisticated, a single eigenvector, although um, like this thing on the website, this was used to explain ocular dominance columns in the brain, a little bit of a detail, but the real point is even with these really simple learning rules, the weights reflect the outside data, okay? Now you have to do something about instability that's fixable. Um, and so, so even though the rules are simple, they, they do tell you something. Now, obviously, um, the brain needs to have an error signal to actually do something sophisticated, but but these now these learning rules, these simple learning rules, can be surprisingly powerful. Okay, um, that's it for today. Um, I'm going to save these to photos. I owe you guys actually two write-ups, which should both be ready Monday if all goes well, at least one. Um, and I will even say I think a few words about. Um, some extensions of, of, of these ideas about synaptic plasticity, um, since things are actually fairly complicated. Okay, as usual, hang around for five minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, put things on the website.
Hello, Professor. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I think the students are yeah. too shy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There. <laughs> I think. Yeah. The class is over. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Bye.